we're now getting into the second half of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, if you are new to these videos, then you might want to go back and watch uh, the video from Nehemiah chapter 1, which will just give you some more context for the book as a whole. But what we've seen predominantly in Nehemiah chapters 1 to 7 is God stirring his people as they are led by Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They wanted to rebuild the walls because God's name and fame in the world were linked with this city. By the time we get to chapter 6 and 7, that project is finished with the help of God. In miraculous time, they finish the walls. But now, from chapter 8 onwards, we see the next rebuilding project begin. Now we see Nehemiah beginning to rebuild the people. And in chapter 8, we see the difference that understanding brings. So I called this section, Understanding Makes All the Difference. As always, I do encourage you to read this chapter a number of times for yourself. Just look out for some key repetition, and there really is some important repetition in this uh, section of the story. And note down questions you might have, uh, things that jump out at you, and as always, I'm going to just take us through this text to show you what I've seen. But if you haven't already done so, I do encourage you to just stop the video now, take some time to pray, and ask God to help you to understand His Word, but not just as an academic exercise. To understand so that God's Word would do a work in you and transform you and change you, so that as you teach this to others, they might also be impacted by God's word and that God by his spirit would do a work in them. Now, as I said, one of the most important words we see in this section is the word understanding. So this way, the Levites instructed the people. It is they gave them understanding. Um, they were helping the people to understand. And that really is an important uh, theme in this chapter. In stories like this, narrative, uh, often the tool, the narrative plot arc, is useful to help you just to see the main things happening in any given story. And so you, you're looking for the setting of that story, you're looking for the conflict that is building, uh, all good stories have conflict that builds, then you're trying to look out for the point of climax, the high, high point of the story, and then after that how the story resolves itself before you're given a new setting. Now, in this section, I, I saw the setting given in 7 verse uh, 73b and 8 verse 1, where we see Jerusalem's walls are now completed and the whole community gather to hear the word of God, the law of God being read. But the conflict builds in chapter 8 verse 2 all the way through to verse 11, so this big section all the way here, where as Ezra the priest reads the law and the Levites help the people to understand, the first response is that the people are cut to the heart and they begin weeping. But they are told not to weep, not to grieve, because this is a day of rejoicing, which we'll see in a moment. And then I think the point of climax uh, comes in 8 verse 12, uh, this verse here as our climactic moment uh, where the people joyfully celebrate because they now understand the word that had been made known to them. And then the story resolves itself uh, in 8 verse 13 through to 18a where we see uh, a genuine joyful obedience. They are strengthened to obey as they now understand God's law. And that obedience fuels a further joy and then our new setting is given in 8 verse 18b where the people gather again and this time um, we'll see a more solemn assembly which leads us into chapter 9. Another useful tool is just to look at all the different characters in the story and the Israelites as a whole, all the people, um, are a key character in this section and it's important to note that it is all the people. They all stand, they all lift their hands, uh, they all bow down and worship. And they are all there being 
instructed in the law of the Lord. So this whole community, now about a hundred years, almost a hundred years earlier, the first uh, group of people had returned from exile in Babylon uh, with uh, Zerubbabel and Shealtiel. About 13 years before this, Ezra the priest had arrived with another group of people and history seems to suggest that people had been trickling back from exile in Babylon. So there were probably about a hundred thousand people gathering. So all the people is a massive gathering at this point. And then the next key character in this section is Ezra, the teacher of the law. Um, he's also Ezra the priest. So this Ezra had returned about 13 years before these events and he was a man who really understood God's word. He wanted people to understand it too. And here, finally, he's given this golden opportunity to teach all the people, a hundred thousand of them. And they are all there wanting to learn. And another key character is just to see uh, the Lord God is mentioned. They are a community who are praising the Lord. They are worshiping the Lord. They are wanting to obey the Lord, which is what we see specifically um, in this last section where the Lord had commanded certain things and they realized they hadn't been living up uh, to what they were meant to be doing. Then Nehemiah himself is also mentioned. So it's almost as if Ezra is taking on his role as more the, the spiritual leader where Nehemiah the governor is leading the people to be a people who live for the glory of God. And he knows that that is going to happen best if they understand God's word. So he is leading them all together and listen to Ezra the priest as Ezra teaches them. The next key thing to see is that Ezra is teaching from the book of the law of Moses. So this is the five, first five books of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, some of the details in this chapter and the next two chapters seem to suggest that the specific book that uh, Ezra was reading from may have been uh, Deuteronomy. It's the books that Moses had, had written for God's people. And so, finally, this community are all there to hear God speak as God's word is opened. And they want to be praising God. They call him the great God. Now we saw this description in chapter 1 and 4 where this is a community who are realizing how great God is and they want to uh, listen to him, they want to obey him, they want to live for him. And then another important repeated idea in this section is this idea of joy. Don't grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We're told that they celebrated with great joy. And then right at the end, after they've responded in obedience, we're told that their joy was very great. So from great joy to very great joy, um, they're going from one level of joy to the next as their understanding fuels them to celebrate and then to obey. That obedience fuels them even further to be a people who, who rejoice even more. Some other repetition we see is that uh, they are told that this day is holy. It's a holy day to the Lord. And we're also told that this is happening in the seventh month, the second day of that same month. So all of these things are happening in the seventh month, which was a really important month for God's people. Um, so important context, if you want to go look up Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 31. Uh, you can go and read chapters like that. It'll just explain a bit more about um, the seventh month. But it was a month where they were to celebrate the, the Feast of Booths was one of the things which we'll see them celebrating. Also, importantly, they celebrate the Day of Atonement. Now, we aren't told about the celebration of the Day of Atonement in this section, but that was the day when they remembered that God had made provision to, to atone for their sins, to deal with their sins. So this seventh month was an important month, and they were celebrating in the first day of that month. It was a holy day, 
and it was meant to be a day of celebration. But we see them as the the law is being read. So Ezra opens uh, the book of the law and all the people stand up and they praise God together. They are really excited that now they are coming to this time when they're going to be taught God's word. And verse 8 is a really glorious verse that explains how they are being taught. So they read, so this is Ezra and the Levites, read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. This is an explanation of expository preaching. So they're reading God's word, they're making it clear, giving the meaning, helping the people to understand what God's word means. And as they do that, the first response we see is this weeping and grieving. Just imagine a hundred thousand people weeping because as the law was being read, they would have realized that they had fallen far short of God's perfect standards. But then Nehemiah says these great and well-known, probably the most well-known verse in the book of Nehemiah. This phrase is quoted on many uh, Christian greeting cards. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It is a great phrase, but what exactly does it mean? And as God's law was being read, it would have reminded them of how their ancestors had been saved from Egypt. They had been rescued, delivered. They were God's treasured possession. And as they heard that news of how God had saved them, it should have caused them to rejoice greatly in who God is and what he had done for them. And so the joy of the Lord and what he has done for them is what would have strengthened them. Strengthened them to be a people, as we'll see, who actually obey God's word. And so from this uh, weeping and grieving, as they are taught further and told, well, the joy of the Lord is your strength, we see the high point of the story as all the people, a hundred thousand of them, go away for a great meal of celebration. They invite others who who can't have a meal for themselves to join, and they celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words of the Lord. What fueled this joy was their understanding. They had been taught well. God's word had been made clear. The meaning had been given, and that understanding fueled their joy. Now, although that is the climactic point, the story does continue. And what we see in this section is a joyful obedience. So the joy of the Lord is your strength. And this true understanding of God's word strengthened them for joyful obedience. You see, as they realized in this seventh month, one of the things that they were meant to do was to live in temporary shelters. This was the festival of booths. Again, you can go and read up about this in Leviticus 23. And that celebration was reminding them of how their ancestors had lived in tents when they came out of Egypt. It was remembering God's great provision, his great salvation, rescuing their ancestors. And they were meant to celebrate this for a week together. And here they go out and tell everyone, come, let's go and get branches, let's build these shelters. And we are told, here verse 17, that the whole community who returned, the whole company, all the people, built these temporary shelters and lived in them. And it hadn't been celebrated like this since the days of Joshua, son of Nun. So for the last thousand years, they hadn't been celebrating this feast the way they were meant to. They hadn't been obedient. But now, as they understood, the joy of the Lord strengthened them to be a people who obeyed. They listened to God's commands, and they did what God said, and that resulted in very great joy. And I think a very important thing for us to see here is that obedience to God's word is not an optional extra for God's people. 
That's what these people came to realize. They hadn't been obeying properly for the last thousand years, but now that they understood, they realized we've got to obey this command. And it's not a begrudging thing to obey. It's actually for our good and it will cause us to rejoice because we are remembering what a great God we serve and how he saved us. And as we think for, as Christians about this statement, the joy of the Lord is your strength, we have even more reason to rejoice. Because we look back not to a rescue from Egypt, we look back to our Lord Jesus dying on the cross, conquering sin and death and the devil, rescuing us in the most amazing way. And as we reflect on that and realize what God has done for us, the joy of the Lord is indeed our strength. And the joy of the Lord motivates us, stirs us to be a people who joyfully obey. Jesus said in Matthew 28, Go and make disciples of all nations. And then he said, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Obedience is not an optional extra for God's people. And this story in Nehemiah shows how God's Old Testament people obeyed. It led to very great joy. It was glorifying to God. And as God's people today, we are also called to be a people who respond to this growing understanding of who God is and what he's done, that we too respond with great joy. And that joy leads us to true obedience to God's commands as we live for his glory. And that's not a begrudging thing. It actually causes us to be a people who rejoice even more as we live God's way. And so as you dig into this and teach it to others, let's challenge each other and encourage each other to be a people who increasingly live lives of obedience. Lives that will be truly glorifying to God. As we come to sections in God's word that call for obedience to some command, let's be praying that God will help us to respond rightly, all in response to what he has done. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He saved us. He's made us his. And in joyful thanksgiving, we respond in joyful obedience, which leads to even greater joy. Well, let's keep encouraging each other in these things. And I pray that you'll have a really fruitful time digging in further and that it may stir your own heart and that those who you teach will also be increasingly stirred by the Spirit at work within them to rejoice in their salvation and to live as obedient children of the King who saved us. Well, God bless as you dig in further.